Hello again, everybody. Uh, Pastor Tom Vanderbilt here from Mount Calvary Lutheran Church here with your longer look at our gospel lesson appointed for this upcoming Sunday, uh, September 20th, 2020. And uh, the uh, gospel lesson comes to us from Matthew chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 16. Um, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. But before we get to the text, I just want to, I always just like to stop and, and point out where we're at in the, in the larger scheme of things uh, because it helps us to understand, um, helps us understand, I think, a little bit the mind of our Lord and, and a little bit more of his plan. It helps us to understand the depth of his plan just a little bit more. So uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but, but repetition is the mother of learning. And so I hope this helps you to understand this more. But we have, ever since Jesus took his disciples away to Caesarea Philippi, and they had that sort of little retreat where Jesus took the pole and he said, who do people say that I am? And some say John the Baptist. And, you know, and Peter has that wonderful confession where he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It's at that point that Jesus reveals what the mission of the Messiah is going to be. In fact, when he reveals that mission, the very next story in Matthew chapter 16 is how Peter rebukes Jesus. He comes to him and says, Lord, this will never be. Uh, and then, then Peter gets accused of being Satan and all that sort of thing. I, I bring that up because that's a turning point in how Matthew tells this story of the gospel. And I always like to bring this up because one of the disservices we do is we chop this story up into these little bite-sized pieces. And, or another way of looking at this would say, we take the whole forest of Matthew's gospel and we're showing you each of the individual trees. And so to fulfill that common cliche, I don't want you to miss what's going on in the forest because you're looking so closely at the trees. Okay, So this Matthew 16, this time of Matthew 16 is a time where things have kind of changed. To back that up in Matthew chapter 17, we had the transfiguration. We didn't talk about that this summer. Uh, we talked about that at the end of the Epiphany season, way back, uh, way back at the end of, um, uh, probably at the end of January, early February, right before, right before we launched into Lent. And my memory's terrible, and I don't remember where that all came up with COVID. Maybe we missed it. I Forgive me for not remembering and not looking it up. After that transfiguration, to drive home this idea of who the Messiah is and what his mission is, in chapter 18, we looked at all those various commands for people to forgive one another. Then, for the most part, we kind of skip over 19, and now we're going to stop in, in um, Matthew chapter 20. We're going to look at the laborers in the vineyard and a few other things. But I bring all this up to, because we need to know what comes next. And that is Matthew chapter 21. And Matthew chapter 21 verse 1 begins with the triumphal entry. Palm Sunday. The beginning of Holy Week. See, That's another thing that sometimes we miss about the Gospels. is we, A lot of the teachings that we're going to hear, uh, probably beginning either next week or the week after. I haven't looked ahead. But a lot of these lessons that we're going to hear Jesus teaching and a lot of the preaching that he's, that he's bringing to his people... It all happens during Holy Week. It happens during that week before his crucifixion. And in my mind, to my understanding, these are kind of like Jesus' last words. Uh, he, as soon as he gets to the triumphal entry, he knows what's going to happen. He knows how his week is going to culminate. He knows that he's coming in Sunday to praises and he's going to go out on Friday to, to uh, jeers and criticism. Um, and so knowing this, it's always seemed to me that the teachings in this this next this last week, this next part of Matthew's gospel, uh, are just a little bit more heartfelt. And I think they're definitely a lot more pointed, where Jesus is just going to get to the heart of the issue. He doesn't have time to sort of dance around things anymore. He's got to get to the heart of the issue, All right? And so I, I just wanted to bring that up and kind of give you sort of the setting for what we're going to talk about here as we talk about this familiar parable of the laborers in the vineyard. But before we read this, the writer of our Bible study wants us to talk about a little something else. So hopefully you've got your handout with you, and if you'll uh, pick that up, then let's read through the first couple of paragraphs and answer that first question uh, as we do. This is another of the parables found only in Matthew's gospel. It offers, up a, it offers us a straightforward lesson, the point of which is not hard to determine and understand. 
It is helpful, however, to see it in context. And that's what I've tried to do is to set a little bit of the extended context. During his interaction with the rich young man who wanted to know what he had to do to get eternal life in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 30, Jesus had challenged him to change the whole focus of his life by giving his wealth to the poor and coming to follow him. The young man had gone away sad for he had great possessions. Then Jesus had turned to his disciples to say, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they had responded, Who then can be saved? Jesus had given the needed direction to his disciples, thinking by responding to their question. With, this, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Peter then boldly and honestly said, We have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And the Bible study reader asks us, or the Bible study writer asks us to read then um, how Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 19, verses 28 to 30. So let me read that for you. Jesus responds and says, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So the writer of our Bible study has a question, question 103, that he'd like for you to answer regarding those verses that lead into the reading of our text. So go ahead and pause the video here. Take a few moments, discuss question 103 amongst yourselves. And when we come back, I'll, I'll add a little bit of insight based on that question. And then we'll get into reading our appointed lesson for today. Welcome back. So question 103 asks, there's actually two questions wrapped up in here. First, what privileged position did Jesus promise to his disciples or promise to his apostles? Of course, we see that Jesus promises that they will sit on 12 stones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, meaning that, um, meaning that the role of a disciple is, is in some ways superior to that of being born into the nation of Israel. It's, it's a hint that this kingdom that is coming is greater than the kingdom of Israel that used to be around. Everyone was looking at, at Jesus as the Messiah as restoring the kingdom of David, ex, of um, expanding their political reach back to what it was under David, to allowing them to be an independent country ruled by their own king once again. And when Jesus says that the, the disciples are going to sit on 12 stones and drudge the 12 tribes of Israel, it means that they are going to be in a greater position. It means that this covenant that Jesus is ushering in as Messiah is not just about establishing a geographical kingdom in the Middle East, but it's about establishing a spiritual kingdom throughout the world, a spiritual kingdom that will find its geographical culmination uh, in, the, in the second coming of Jesus, when, when he will descend from heaven with a shout and a cry and the new Jerusalem will come down and we'll all live in this perfect world that, as it was originally intended, uh, with grace abounding and sin eradicated. Um, that's what he's saying there. That's the privilege that Jesus promised to his disciples. And, and then how did he expand his assurance to include all of his followers? He goes on to say that everyone who has left everything, it's not just going to be just these 12, but everyone who has left anything for his sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So first of all, when Jesus says that they will, they will receive a hundredfold, he's not necessarily talking about uh, this physical life, this material world that we live in now. That's his way of saying that the glories and the praises, the joys, um, the blessings of eternal life are 
infinitely better than anything that we may have sacrificed for his kingdom on earth. Um, they are infinitely better than anything it may have cost us along the, along the path of following Jesus. Eternal life is much more valuable than the hours upon hours that we may have wasted in the time, in the eyes of some, going to church, serving church. That the, the security that we'll have in eternal life is infinitely more than the money we may have wasted by giving it to the church and supporting its mission. Um, that the, uh, that it's another way for Jesus to, to drive home his words when he tells his disciples that anyone who rejects you rejects me. And so anybody who may reject us because we're trying to share the, this good news of the coming kingdom of our Lord with them, that, that rejection is infinitesimal compared to the joy of being in the Father's loving presence. And they're not, in any way, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting the one who has sent us. Okay, So here you have... Um, uh, so this is what Jesus is leading into. And so to make that point, he then tells this parable. So let me read the parable for you. Uh, we're reading from Matthew chapter 20, verse 1, uh, down to verse 16. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Uh, if you're reading from a different translation, it may sound just a little bit different. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them to his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And, he, and to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Thus far the text. There's a couple of paragraphs of explanation that will help you on the next few questions that are about to come up. So let's read through those paragraphs and then I'll, we'll pause and let you discuss the questions. Jesus ended his comments with a uh, mashal, a pithy cryptic statement intended for mulling over and chewing on. He repeated it at the end of this parable. So the parable is surely an expansion of what had pre preceded it. Matthew chapter 20, verse 16 is pretty much word for word what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. So that means that these two things have gone together. Again, it's important for us to see the entire context of the gospel, of the story that Matthew is telling to us. These two things are joined together. Going on to explain the parable, the writer says, A denarius was the usual pay for a day laborer. Who usually worked up worked from sun up to sundown, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., to earn his pay. Often his ability to feed his family for another day depended on his being hired. The point of Jesus' parable hinges on the landowners hiring workers at various times during the day and then paying all the same wage, a denarius. 
And so there are questions 104, 105, and 106 that explore this parable in a little bit more depth. Go ahead and pause the video here and discuss those questions amongst yourselves and you can restart the video when you're ready. Let's dive into those questions now, shall we? Question 104 asks, what was Jesus teaching about the kingdom with this parable? Um, so what is Jesus teaching about the kingdom? He starts this out by saying the kingdom of heaven is like, is it heaven or the kingdom of God? Yep, the kingdom of heaven is like a man or a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. So in this parable, what is Jesus trying to teach that his kingdom is like? He's teaching us that his kingdom is based entirely on grace. That life in the kingdom of God is based entirely on the gracious injustice of the king. That's right, injustice. Throughout our lives, we look for we look for our lives, we, we look for justice. We ask for people to give us what we what we deserve, to give us what we owe, to we want them to pay us what they owe us. But we dare not ever go before the Lord and ask him to give us what we deserve. I believe it's Romans chapter 3 that reminds us that the wages of sin, what we deserve, our wage that we get for our lives here, what we truly deserve, the wages of sin is death. And not just physical death, but eternal death. Uh, separation from God. Uh, exclusion from eternal life. We never ask God for what we deserve. Never. We always ask for God to be unjust because you have to understand that mercy is a form of injustice. Um, that's one of the things that just we, we kind of overlook in our society, that it is, it's just when it is just as it's just as much of an injustice for us to get off, uh, to be let off of speeding with a warning. That is just as much of an injustice as being pulled over and given a ticket for something we didn't do. Those are both examples of justice not being done. One of them is merciful and one of them is not. And we tend to overlook the merciful one because, you know, we're really not that bad anyway. I mean, it's only speeding. It's not like we're, it's not like we're doing drugs or murdering anyone or anything like that. Uh, and in the civil realm, that works. But you have to understand that mercy is just as much has just as much injustice to it as being accused and and punished for something that we didn't do. Um, so we can never go before our God and we can never ask Him to be just and fair because if He takes that to its logical end, we have no hope. We always become before our King and we remind Him that His kingdom is based entirely on grace. Now, question four, 104 goes on to ask, uh, what would be a comparable situation in the life of the church today? Uh, a comparable situation is we look at workers coming and receiving what they're due, so to speak, or being compensated for their day's work. Very similar situation would be comparing someone who is a lifelong member of a church to someone who comes to faith later in life. It's very easy for us who have been members of a Christian church for a long time to think as though somehow we are entitled to something more. Um, when we hear about others who have uh, shirked their faith or shunned the Lord for so many, excuse me, for so many years, and then they come to faith in Jesus and they too receive eternal life, it's really easy for us to think to ourselves, well, that means I must be have, I must get something more. There's got to be something better for me. If that person got eternal life for what he did, then certainly I'm going to get more than that. But that's not the way it is. Jesus tells this parable to tell us that no matter when it is that we come to faith, we will receive the gift of eternal life. That salvation, forgiveness, life eternal, all of them are ours, whether we have whether we have spent the heat of the day and borne the, the, the majority of the burden, carrying on the Christian faith and tradition throughout our entire lives, or whether we are someone who as death approaches, 
realizes the error of their ways and in repentance they call out in faith to Jesus. Both of us will receive the exact same eternal life. We both have the same assurance. And we thank God that it is that way. I, I would hate for someone who comes to I would hate for someone who doesn't know Jesus to think to themselves, and this is another this is another reason why we have to preach this so clearly. Because I would hate for someone who doesn't know Jesus to think to themselves, you know what? I'm middle-aged now. I'm in my, you know, I'm in my 40s or 50s and and I didn't live my life up until now the way I should. And do I have time to pay off that debt? Do I have enough time to do enough good things to balance out all those bad things that I've done in the past? Hmm. We don't want people to worry about that. We don't want people to worry about if they have enough time, if there is breath in their lungs, if there is blood flowing through their veins, if there's still life in their body, then there is time for them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But how do I know for sure that I'm going to receive the same gift that you get, Pastor? You've been a Christian almost your whole life. How can I be sure that I'm going to get the same thing you get? Oh, well, let me tell you this parable that Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 20. And he makes it very, very clear that even, that even you, somebody who is just now coming to, to understand the love of your, of your Savior, Jesus Christ, that even you will get paid the full day's wage, that even you will get the denarius, that even you will get the assurance of eternal life. Um, uh, so we, we have to always remember that God's kingdom is a gracious kingdom. It works 100% based on grace. All right, let's move on to question 105. What was Jesus warning against, uh, what, or excuse me, what was Jesus warning against by having the landowner ask, do you begrudge my generosity? What is Jesus warning about? I, I think at, at first blush, it's very easy for us to see that he's, he's warning us about um how easy it is for us to step from grace to works. How easy it is for us to move from receiving everything by grace and then we work under that for a couple of years and along comes this new guy and we think, okay, well, new guy, yeah, you got it all by grace, but you have to understand I've added, I've added three years of service to that grace. And so I have a little more. No, you don't. No, you don't. You got the same. You're both getting a denarius. You both have forgiveness, salvation, eternal life. You both got the same. And that's okay. Because when you when that eternal life comes into its fulfillment, as, as Jesus said in the verses prior to this parable, it's like a hundredfold. It's, it's, it's beyond your imagination. You have no idea what is waiting for you in all of that. But I think that something else that Jesus is warning against do you begrudge my generosity? Are you telling me what, I, what to do with my money? You know, that's what he goes on to say in the very next line. Am I not allowed to do what I choose? Or I'm, I'm sorry, that's the, the, verse, the line before it in the same verse. My, my, my apologies. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Are we going to sit and say, Lord, I know, you know, I know John 3, 16, I know that you loved everybody in the world so that you gave your son to die for them, that whoever believes in you would have eternal life. I, I know that, I believe that, but I also know John, and I know, what, and I know what John's like, and I know what he is, and I know what he's done. I know what he's done to me personally, I know what he's done to our town, I know what he's done. Are you sure you want to give him this? Is God not allowed to do what he wants with what's, what belongs to him? Is he not allowed to do what he chooses with what belongs to him? See, if salvation is by grace and grace alone, which we firmly believe that it is, and we have for hundreds of years, thousands of years, if salvation comes by grace alone, then it belongs to God always. And he can give it to whomever he wants. Um, we are just thankful that we are ones to whom he has given it. We're just thankful that we are ones to whom he has come and given that gift of eternal life. 
And now we go around and we're trying to help others to understand that that gift of eternal life is theirs too. That it's not too late. Don't worry. Even if you're only going to put in an hour's worth of work, you're still going to get the denarius. Um, you know, that's a thing to note about this parable that Jesus brings up. The only people that have a sure contract with the, with the landowner are the first ones. He goes out in the, um, let me look at the text here real quick. Yeah, he, he went out early to hire laborers and after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, they have this agreement. After that, after that, everybody else just has a promise. Go work in my vineyard. I'll pay you whatever's fair. Well, what's going to be fair? Half a denarius? Three quarters of a denarius? Um, uh, every one of those is relying on the promise of the, of the master of the vineyard. Um, and that's an important for, lesson for us to remember too. Each of us is relying on the, grace, the, the uh, gracious promise of the master of the vineyard. That each and every one of us relies on grace and grace alone uh, in order to inherit this eternal life that Jesus promises. It's, and so we have to always keep that in mind because it's very easy for us to slip from this idea of, oh yes, I'm saved by grace and grace alone. But I also do all this stuff too. Isn't that neat? Isn't that cool? Doesn't that add something to it? Well, if you add something to the gospel, it's no longer the gospel. If you add something to grace, if you do something to earn grace, it's no longer grace. You know, there's a there's a difference between a there's a difference between a Christmas bonus that is given to everyone for being a part of the team and a performance bonus that is given to people because of what they've done for the team. Those are different. Uh, one is a gift given freely to everybody. The other is a wage that was earned, usually as part of a, of a contract or an agreement for compensation. Uh, and so we always, but how easy it is for us to take this gift and say, well, but I deserve this gift because I've done this, 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 and this. As soon as you deserve it, you're in the realm of ranges. And once you're in the, in the realm of wages, um, we know what it is that our wages deserve, what our wages should be. So we always have to remember that, that God's kingdom is a merciful and gracious kingdom. Question 106, and we'll wrap it up here. In light of the parable, it asks, interpret Jesus' mashal, that the last will be first and the first will be last. It's one final reminder to us that God's kingdom is vastly different than our kingdom. That the way that God works in this world is very, very different from the way that our world regularly works. And this isn't the first time we've heard it. Jesus says earlier, and just uh, we read this a few weeks ago, that the one who would be greatest in the kingdom must be the servant of all. Hmm. That's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. Um, usually when you are greater in an earthly kingdom, you are less of a servant. But Jesus says, no, the greatest must be slave to all. Likewise, Jesus says in Luke's gospel, he says there's greater rejoicing in the kingdom of heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. That means that God is more excited when there's one person who didn't know Jesus in our worship services, and they've come to know him and they've repented and they've come to worship that day, that he's more excited to have them in our worship service than 99 other people who should have been there anyway. Mm. That's something for us to chew on a little bit, isn't it? Uh, that if we really, can we, can we extrapolate that? And can we, I wonder, is it fair for us to say that God then would be more pleased if we were to bring a friend who didn't know Jesus to worship than if we brought 99 of our friends who already knew Jesus to worship. I don't know. I'm going to ponder that. You ponder it too. Um, send me, get in touch with me. Send me a message, an email, something like that. Um, you, can, uh, you can give me some feedback. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can give me some feedback on that and let me know what you think. Um, something, it's something for us to ponder. Something for us to ponder. Um, so if this is the case, 
that Jesus tells us that the last will be first and the first will be last, that the one who would be greatest must become the least and the servant, that there's more rejoicing over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who didn't need to repent. If, this, if these are the keys that Jesus gives us to understanding the kingdom of God, then it should be no surprise to us that the last to come to the vineyard would be paid first because they had the farthest to travel. It would come as no surprise that the, the landowner would say, you know what, it's time to pay everybody, and so bring those that only worked an hour and let them receive their, let them receive their, um, their pay first because they've had the farthest to travel. They've gone the longest without the assurance of Jesus. Those of us who have walked with Jesus for a long time, we, we know him. We know his grace. We know his mercy. We know, we know how he works in our lives, sometimes through ordinary means and sometimes miraculously. We know this. We can trust him. Uh, it's almost as if we've worked for him before and we, he's always made good on his promises. But there are some who, don't, who, who haven't walked with him that much yet. There's some who don't know that Jesus makes good on their promises. And so it's important for them to be paid first so that they can see that, yes, Jesus does keep his promises. That's going to do it for today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our lesson. Again, give that idea a little thought, and I'd love to hear your feedback. You can uh, call or, or email or text, Facebook Messenger. I try to look at that every once in a while. Um, I'd just like to know your thoughts. Ponder that a little bit. Wrestle with it. Let's, let's talk about it when we get a chance. Uh, but until that time when we have to talk with each other and we have those conversations, I, I pray that the Lord will keep you. In fact, let's, uh, let's close our time now with a little prayer. Dismiss us with thy blessing, Lord. Help us to feed upon thy word. All that has been amiss, forgive, and let thy truth within us live. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Peace be with you all.